I'm happy to welcome you to uh, this session of our Noontime Conversation. Before I begin, I want uh, all of us to quickly, um, a round of applause for the staff of CTRL who put on this uh, excellent event and for the food that is also provided. So thank you. And so today marks the last of the Noontime Conversations, but I uh, wa want you to know that there are lots of other events that are continuing to be offered through CTRL, including a series of Chalk Talks and Tech Talks. So please keep your uh, email. Don't delete them right, right away. Read them first. Uh, there are lots of really fun and useful things that are being offered by CTRL. It is my great pleasure to introduce two panelists for this afternoon's Noontime Conversation, uh, Garrett Grady Lovelace from SIS and Jane Palmer from SPA. And I will hand over the mic to them. Feel free to continue to uh, eat and um, enjoy this afternoon's presentation on being a part of DC, not apart from DC. Please. And with that in mind, we think now is an excellent time because our new provost, Dan Myers, is very excited about community-based scholarship. And this was one of his um, big accomplishments at his previous institutions. So we had the chance to meet with him and invite him to give a keynote at this noontime conversation. He was not able to, so we have filmed him. Um, and he's going to be introducing himself and his excitement in working with us to advance this at AU across the campus and have AU really become a leader in community-based scholarship. Um, really nationally and even internationally. So, yes. So I'm about to introduce that video. And um, before I start, I, I just wanted to um, also not forget to pass around two books that I highly recommend if you're looking to do this in your classroom. This orange one, anyone that's doing any kind of community-engaged learning, whether it's uh, more traditional service learning or community-based research, I highly, 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 highly recommend that students read this book uh, because it is, it is amazing. It's an incredible book I wish I wrote. This book is the textbook that I wrote, uh, that I didn't write. I don't know why I just said that. <laughs> that um, that, uh, <laughs> that I also use in my class if you're thinking about doing community-based research. It's a very slim volume. Um, I think it needs to be supplemented with a more traditional social science research methods book, but it's really good to talk about the community-based participatory research. Um, do one on this side and one on the other side. And then I'm going to pull up the video of Provost Myers uh, welcoming us to this event. Hopefully the sound works. Okay. Hello, friends. I wish I had been able to join you today for your discussion of community engagement. As some of you know, this is a special interest of mine, and I've seen powerful work done when faculty, staff, students, and community organizations link arms in a truly engaged, symbiotic manner that benefits all. For the community organizations, the engagement can lead to improved outcomes and networking with others who can help them achieve their mission. For students, the engagement is one of those high impact experiences that brings their university experience to life and can produce a sense of efficacy and purpose that conditions the rest of their educational experience and even their vocational trajectory. For the faculty, community engagement not only produces an opportunity to guide students through a formative process, but also to enhance their own scholarship in unique ways that can benefit their disciplinary and interdisciplinary literatures. I hope you have a great conversation today, and I'll look forward to your ideas about how we can accelerate the integration of community engagement into the life of American University. excited about that that ending um he was also really really disappointed that he couldn't be here today um he had a, another another uh, meeting um uh and also i want to share that alicia horton at the last minute wasn't isn't able to be here because a funder decided that today would be a great day for a site visit so she kind of had to be on site as the executive director of the organization but i drove down to columbia heights and i got a video with her so she will be doing her presentation um via kaltura as well uh, so, uh, luckily, I learned how to use that software on snow days um, to be able to bring people here that couldn't be here in person. So, actually, I'm going to pull that up now.
So we asked her to talk a little bit about, so let me just give you an introduction to Alicia. She's been at uh, Thrive BC for a long time. Um, and <coughs> Is it on? Oh, I just need to be closer, okay. Uh, let me introduce Alicia uh, real quick. Uh, she's been at Thrive BC a long time. She's the executive director. Um, uh, I also didn't really introduce myself more formally. I know a lot of faces in this room, but I direct a program called Community-Based Research Scholars and a certificate program in community-based research here. And so uh, Thrive BC is one of our ongoing partners, but there's lots of other uh, um, faculty and students who have volunteered with or worked with Thrive DC on community uh, university partnerships. Um, she's gonna talk a lot about a project we did two years ago uh, with them that involved community-based research, but I also wanna mention that a lot of AU students volunteer there. It's a, it's a um, organization that serves people experiencing homelessness. They do everything but shelter. So showers, laundry, people can get their mail there. That's super, super important. Um, um, food hot and cold, uh, they have support groups like music therapy, they just have a lot of amazing services. Obviously everything's offered for free. Um, and the organization's been around for like 40 years. Uh, and so she'll talk, we asked her to talk a little bit about sort of what she's seen gone, go well in community university partnerships and what uh, she, in, in a little bit about what doesn't go quite as well. Um, I think because I was sitting in next to her as she was being videotaped, she talked a lot about our partnership but I want to be clear, she's had partnerships with lots of, really great partnerships with lots of faculty at AU and not just me. I'm here today and I'm so sorry I couldn't be um, there in person, but um, I absolutely wanted to be able to contribute to the conversation. So, um, so glad technology has enabled me to do that. So welcome everybody to the forum. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really um, excited about this forum because the university and community organization partnership, I think, is um, a really critical partnership in that it gives people an opportunity to put into practice um, the theory and all of the, uh, you know, incredibly rich learning that they have in the classroom and really take that into a real life experience and um, an exercise and flex some different kinds of muscles as they um, are implementing um, and uh, working to build and, and create projects. And we have had some really exceptional um, uh, experiences working with the AU community and the student body. And, um, you know, one of the, the ones that stand out so much in my mind is um, the opportunity to help our staff and um, organization engage in some really critical um, uh, information gathering from our client community. It gives us an opportunity to, uh, to get some um, important information about who we're serving and um, what kinds of uh, uh, characteristics this community um, are bringing to the table so that we can adapt programming and, um, and services to really provide um, quality support. So um, uh, Jane and her class came uh, to us to help put together um, a, a, a survey assessment instrument. And um, we really, it was an incredible um, effort. We were able to pull together a really great assessment tool um, the students in the class with, um, under the direction of, of Dr. Jane, I'll call her, <laughs> um, were able to um, organize an implementation strategy where students came in and, and it was a long survey, you know, kind of like a 20 minute survey and they actually walked our client community through the survey. It took a few days and um, we had some Spanish speakers and uh, so there were, kind of several elements of this project that um, needed to come together in order to make it successful. And uh, Jane and this, the class of students really brought their full game to the effort and we were able to, um, to create uh, and implement a survey that um, provided us with some really rich and robust information around um, our client community. And again, this helped us inform 
um, our practices and our programming so that we can make sure we're doing the best um, for our clients. And um, not only did they help develop um, and implement the survey, then they helped analyze the data and, and give us back um, a, an incredible report that was so easily digestible and um, user friendly that um, again, you know, sometimes those kind of efforts can give you information that is so lofty, you, re you really don't know how to use it. But this was um, completely um, at our level and able to um, be integrated right into our programming. So this was one of the incredibly successful efforts that um, I've seen happen between um, uh, university and community. And I think um, that the students uh, were able to, um, my, my impression was that they felt like they got a lot out of having an opportunity to really bring down, again, some of those, uh, you know, uh, good theory-based uh, education that they had gotten um, and really uh, work on that with um, real people in real time. Um, so I hope that was the case. That that uh, certainly was my impression. And I, I think even speaking to a few clients that they, um, I mean, a few students, that's what they shared with me. I think, um, you know, it's important um, I think some of the things that we did well in that community, in that partnership, was that we um, allowed folks to um, come to the table together and plan. So we had, um, you know, many discussions with Dr. Jane and our staff, and really talked about the kind of project we wanted to put together and what um, we hoped uh, to accomplish, and. Um, and so we were on the same page, and and we really did get what we wanted out of out of the um, out of the effort. Um, I think this is one of the critical areas where we see missteps, and that is where um, the uh, the university entity and the community based entity perhaps are not on the same page, and have not done the the pre work, the the collaboration and um, planning that uh, really is required to make sure that you get the product you want. And that um, the goals of the students and the class are very clearly identified so that they know um, what it is they're expecting to, um, to gain from the experience. And I think, again, we did that well. And I think I've been involved in other projects where that kind of work didn't happen before. And, um, and the project, um, you know, just didn't go as well, and, and then people were disappointed in, in the overall product. I think um, the other thing is that um, I think what makes this a, a really successful effort is that it seems the university really supports this effort, and it really supports this programming to the extent that they have created this whole institution around um, this kind of work, and I think that is incredible, and I think um, it really does um, propel uh, these kinds of partnerships and um, and the kind of products that can come out of them. You know, these are things that uh, small and medium-sized nonprofits just could never afford to do. We could never afford the kind of expertise that Jane and her team bring and the students bring. Um, so, you know, these are the kind of um, work. This is the kind of work that we. Uh, would go without, you know, <laughs> and we would not have this important, um, pivotal information that um, makes our programming so much better and uh, so much fuller and richer for our client community. Um, you know, it's it's it feels like a luxury, but it really is a necessity if you want to uh, to have good pro programming, to have the opportunity to bring in this kind of expertise and. Um, these kind of partnerships allow that. Um, and again, we wouldn't be able to do it other, otherwise. Um, in addition to um, just the people power, um, uh, I can't even remember, I don't know, maybe 15 students um, that we brought in uh, to help us with this effort. It may, it may have even been more, but that kind of um, people power <laughs> is something, again, I could never pay for. Um, so we would it would have taken us weeks to have gotten um, those surveys done, um, but we set up tables and folks came in and every table was personed and um, a client was able to sit with someone and actually go through this survey and make sure they understood the questions and, and, uh, and you know, had the, um, the right kinds of responses that uh, the question was trying to get to. So, yeah, again, 
no amount of money that we could afford uh, could ever have been put in, in that um, area. So, uh, so we were um, thrilled. And again, um, the support of the, univer the university and the additional um, uh, uh, support of the professor and the commitment to this kind of a partnership, I think, um, makes all the difference. Um, I would encourage uh, more universities to step into the space and really um, um, proceed with the level of dedication that I've seen AU um, uh, put into this, this kind of work. And um, I think we could um, do some really incredible things. And we're excited about new partnerships and new projects that we could uh, work on together with, uh, with, the, with uh, AU and, um, and the students. And um, I, I just, I hope everybody understands again um, the importance of uh, applying the practical and theory with um, on ground um, actual work. And so you actually begin to see how um, all that brain power <laughs> can really make the difference in the lives of, of, of people that we see every day. So thank you so much. Good luck, everybody. And I'm again, so sorry I couldn't be with you all. Send me a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And one thing I want to mention um, about that project, um, I, I went to their 40th anniversary kickoff fundraiser and I was chatting with staff and they're like, oh, your survey, my first day as new development person was like, my first day on the job, I had to write a grant that was due in two days, but I was able, they were just able to like plop your data down, the PowerPoints your students had made, the spreadsheet and everything. And I wrote the grant and we got the first grant in DC to help Oh, excuse me, I don't know what I just did. Uh, to help um, ho people experiencing homelessness who are, have also experienced victimization. So we had asked some questions on the survey about experiences with victimization. Um, and nobody else is doing that work in DC. And they were able to be funded by um, Office of Victim Services and Justice Grants in DC um, because they actually had data about their client population and their experiences. So it's so important. I, of course, can talk about this for hours, and I, and I won't, I promise. We all have other things to do today. but. Um, I am a former executive director of a, of a nonprofit, and I know what it's like not to have the data you need or to be tell funders or board of directors. I think we're making a difference. It seems like we might be making a difference, but to actually have data to be like, we are making a difference is just huge. So I'm actually gonna sit down for this next part. Yeah. Um, well, I'm just gonna talk briefly about how oh, I, was, I was still gonna do it. Go ahead, I'll go after you. I was gonna talk a little bit more. About Okay, I just wanted to sit. <laughs> um, so I was going to talk a little bit about the missteps and missteps that I've seen in the community. That was just my transition from Alicia's uh, point in the panel. Um, so um, since I've been faculty, I've been faculty, full-time faculty. I was an adjunct before I was full-time uh, since uh, 2013. Um, Community-Based Research Scholars was founded in spring of 2014. We have a member of our first cohort here in the room who's now a master's student and employed at the Center for Community Engagement and Service. Um, hi, Sagar. Um, and uh, uh, it was just the perfect sort of timing at AU to really um, have this program to be able to do these partnerships. As a former social worker, I was really confident I would know how to do this right and well, but that doesn't mean I've always done this right and well. Um, I've, I've learned a lot along the way. Um, I think it did help that I had experience in nonprofits, but I think that what's the most challenging for me, and I'm actually dealing with this right now with my current SPA 340 community-based research class, and I won't go into detail, because again, another three hours, but we have this tight timeline of like a 14-week semester. And we have to do IRB, and we have to not be disruptive of the lives of the people that we want to do community-based research with. And managing all of that in the 14-week um, the semester is, is very challenging. And so I do need to start two, three months in advance. And, and the students are like, well, I want to help with the IRB, or I want to help with the outreach to the community. And I said, I want you to but we literally can't do that and go out into the community and come back and analyze the data and present the data back to the community. I've also taught more traditional community-based learning courses um, with um, a class on uh, childhood 
uh, where students like are learning about uh, how inequality in public policy affect children's experiences of childhood. But they're also volunteering in the community with children. Amazing, right? And seeing a more hand in hand how the education system or how the criminal justice system or how um, responses to child abuse and neglect are affecting kids like today as opposed to these books. A lot of the childhood books, not that you know, you need you know you care about this, but maybe you do. A lot of the childhood books were written in the nineties and I like read them when I was in college and I and there's not a lot since then. So they need to have some present tense conversations about, about how this stuff manifests today. And that's, a, that's what I remember in college myself. I remember, what I remember from college is the work I did in the community more than what I learned in the classroom. That was what was most impactful for me in my future career. Um, and I think, um, like Alicia said, the sort of pre-work, I guess is my emphasis, is really important. I really, really, uh, uh, I among um, Garrett, Melissa, other faculty in this room are liaisons to the faculty in our schools to help, help them do community-based learning. And I think my biggest piece of advice is start early uh, and try to have your ducks in a row like a month before the semester starts if you can because, um, uh, and I know Marcy runs it a little differently and she could, you know, if you talk with her one-on-one, -on -one, she could talk, talk about it where, where the students actually go out and figure out where they wanna work and that's a different model but maybe it's just my sort of like type A personality. I need to have everything lined up ahead of time um, just so that uh, the students can get out there as soon as possible. Um, the other thing that I really, really encourage, and I think this goes along in the conversation of steps and missteps, 14 weeks, if you're a kid and you've got somebody coming in to tutor you for maybe 10 of those 14 weeks and then they leave and you never see them again, like, They've actually researched that shows that what's harder, like uh, Big Brothers, an evaluation of Big Brothers and Big Sisters, what was harder on them was not that they got the time with the mentor, it was that the time with the mentor was so limited and the, the person would just disappear or go back to their home or whatever. So with CBRS, because I have control over them in a way I don't of other students, I now require them to spend their whole first year at the same uh, place. And we can't do that with our structure, but maybe that's a conversation we can have with the provost, right? I don't know. But we want to be creative with the provost since this is something he's passionate about, of like how we could change, maybe there are structural things we could change to really encourage uh, students to have more sustainable partnerships. When I was an undergrad, I volunteered three years at the same nonprofit for 15 hours a week. Here, it's all about the semester. I was an intern, I was fall intern here, I was a spring intern here, I was a summer intern here, and it's all three different organizations. It's quantity over quality. So what I've been trying to really emphasize with my students is, sure, in my class you're gonna be working this place. What do you think about continuing to work there? Or the other thing I try to do is pass the baton among students. So I think Marcy does this well with her class too, where she works with the same partners, so it may not be the same student, but we're having a sustainable partnership, um, and we're not just coming in and out of these partnerships. And then with the community-based learning advisory board, we kind of spread the word of partners we're working with so that, again, we have some continuity. So there might be a health studies um, professor whose class is, is, is complementing what um, my class did the previous semester. Another example I have of that is one of my students worked with Safe Shores, a child abuse advocacy center, and they made a referral manual. Uh, for their community-based project uh, was one of the things they did, is they made a referral manual for the families who were bringing their kids in who had, who had experienced abuse. So the next semester, uh, Professor Brenda Wirth in World Languages and Cu Cultures in her Spanish translation community-based learning class translated the manual into Spanish and identified Spanish-speaking places for families to go to. So again, it's that how do we collaborate among one another to pass the baton so that, because to be honest, AU doesn't care, I mean AU. Community partners, <laughs> we can talk about what AU does or doesn't care about, but that's not the purpose of this panel. Community partners see me as AU. They don't know I'm in School of Public Affairs or Department of Justice, Law and Criminology. They see all of us as AU, so we've actually had experiences where more than one faculty member has been at the same nonprofit. We had no idea the other was also working with that nonprofit. We literally bumped into each other, but the, the partner didn't have any reason to tell us because they assumed we all knew, right? And so, again, something we've been having, and I feel like we've had a lot of these conversations, and a lot of you have been part of these conversations, how do we increase our communication among each other and also share um, uh, our resources and, and who we're working with so that we're having a larger quality instead of quantity impact with some of these community partners. Um, and then, um, lastly, I'll just say uh, this idea of cultural humility is really important, and going into a community being very clear, you are not the expert of that community, right? 
and that they have the expertise and you're here to support them with assets that you have from your university and how can you do that? Um, and uh, assuming, uh, uh, another, another misstep is assuming trust and respect instead of earning that trust and respect from a community partner. Um, and uh, not having that sort of mutual recognition or figuring out how it's mutually beneficial. Sometimes it's funny, um, partners will be so excited about collaborating with us and they really are focused on our students' experience and mentoring those students and they're excited to host them. And I'm like, how can we benefit you too, right? So like sometimes I'm really dedicated to mutually beneficial and sometimes they're like, oh, this will be a great experience for your students. And I'm like, but let's make sure we're not burdening you so that our students can have a great experience. Like how can we make it mutually beneficial and reciprocal? So I think those are my main sort of things that I think a lot about probably too much is sort of like this reciprocity um, and sustainability. Uh, are my biggest sort of things when I think about this. And this cultural humility and respect of the knowledge that is not yours. Um, and that just because we have fancy titles or work at a fancy university, uh, you know, I don't go in, she calls me Dr. Jane, but I don't, I don't introduce myself as Dr. Palmer when I'm in the community, for example, or dress up. Um, I, I guess I dress up wherever I go. But, um, <laughs> I try to remember. Um, but you all know the why, that's why you're here. So I'd like to actually spend our time together thinking about the how. Can we take this to the next level? Um, but just very briefly, so I'm Garrett Grady Lovelace. I'm at the School of International Service. Um, and I've worked on community-based learning at the undergrad level and have CBL classes and I worked with Marcy and Jane on, a, on, on CBRS programs. Mm -hmm. And I have found that pedagogically, um, the high impact learning for undergrads is off the charts when they're actually thinking about how they apply, I do food and agricultural policy to actual anti-hunger, food justice, urban agriculture initiatives in farm labor initiatives in DC. And even, D we're so lucky to be in DC. You've got these national organizations and international organizations that are based here that students can work with and learn from on the ground. And not just in a service or a volunteering capacity, but in a mutually beneficial conducting original research that's actually of use and of interest to people on the ground, practitioners, frontline community groups, grassroots organizations, as well as intellectually useful for the students themselves. So I work also at the graduate level. So I'd like to also brainstorm with people about the graduate student experience of this. So I design and lead a practicum with the Rural Coalition and the National Family Farm Coalition and other grassroots, largely farmer of color and women farmer-led, farm worker-led organizations trying to reform agricultural policy. And it has been hard, so challenging, because the semester time frame is tiny, and the rest of the world doesn't think in terms of semesters. So we do some prep work. You know, we've worked at the same organizations I've worked now for five years, and it's taken them two or three years to get the rhythm of the semester and realize that they can't not answer an email in March because everything's due in April, even if the farm bill itself is happening or something real is happening. So it's actually been a capacity building experience for me, learning how to work with these, with these amazing you know, frontline organizations, as well as for the groups themselves, figuring out what would a research task look like that's feasible mm -hmm. for graduate students and be kind of discreet enough to be done at the end of April. Um, and what we've come to is we've realized like maps are important, data is important, oral histories are important. There's a few things that over the years we've come to. This didn't work, this did work. How can we build off what works? So the iterative aspect I have found very powerful, and you've talked a little about passing the baton. That works both logistically in the sense that the group that worked on fisheries, and sustainable fishing, they got halfway through their project and then had a deliverable, and then the next group of students built upon that to really deepen it. 
but also in the level of trust and building trust. And so I kind of, one student actually told me she went out to the farm and met these amazing civil rights leaders of farming in the Deep South. They're doing this federation of Southern cooperatives and said, I felt so honored to be there. They didn't know me and yet they trusted me with their stories because they'd worked with previous students. So it was like, she called it, it was like a transfer of trust. You know, you, you're walking and you're not just representing yourself, but all the people who are working in that practicum or in the university. So there's an interesting mode that we're having to kind of organize ourselves as a university to best work with community groups that are themselves trying to really overcome a long history of being exploited by researchers. I mean, a lot of these communities that we work with, maybe they're tribal organizations, maybe they're organizations of farm workers that haven't fully trusted academics. Academics have come in, taken pictures, taken notes, taken, taken, taken for many years, many generations arguably. So this kind of reorienting academia to not just coming and appropriating knowledge and then coming back and coding and becoming experts on people and their pain, but actually working with community groups on a research project where the community groups are themselves designing the research and what data they need, because everybody needs data right now, you know, or even qualitative and documentaries and multimedia, uh, but also the shared analysis part, where the data does gets collected or all those oral histories come out or all of, you know, the various survey results come in and then the community partners are there with the scholars and the students to analyze it and really come up with what's significant about this, what's missing, how do we take this information and move it forward in a way that's useful. So that means everything from where do you publish it? Is it open access? Is it a public um, deliverable of some sort? So really diving deep into community-based scholarship is really transformative for academia itself. Um, and I think one thing, there's a misconception that it means less lessening the, the quality of the scholarship if you're working with community groups on a research project. But in fact, it actually, I would argue, and a few others I know in this room we've had this conversation, it augments the rigor. Because if you are someone who's being surveyed and someone comes in an academic and is like, here, tell me all about your pain or your failed crop harvest or your hunger in your family, the sense of trust to be able to pass on you know, your knowledge and your struggles to a stranger, if it, was a if it was a research that was in dialogue and you felt like you were, you were invested in the research project process and the product, you would want to share your stories and your valuable information and your experiences of what you're planting and how your family's struggling with hunger. And so it actually would make for more better data, frankly, at the end. So there's a way in which the intellectual excellence of this um, is really latent, I think, but quite, you know, quite potent. Um, and so it's really up to us to think about community-based teaching and community-based scholarship as um, the bar is still quite high. You know, you can do this really poorly, you can fail at it, um, but it doesn't, we, we have to kind of change our definition of excellence. It's a different, mm -hmm. you know, process and it needs different standards and metrics, which gets me to many of the missteps. There are so many, logistically, it takes so much time to work with people, to meet them on their own terms, when they can meet. Um, it takes traveling, it takes some funding to make sure if you meet with people that there's a meal there and you've provided it um, because people are taking time out of their busy lives to kind of share with you even their ideas for what research projects could happen. So what would funding look like where um, scholars are able to buy a nice meal for everyone to get the project rolling, even modest honorariums for people who've really devoted their whole semester to working with community partners, um, or even ways to have the public deliverable be really like fancy high quality color brochures that they can use, but the uh, AU is paid for it. Um, so I think slight funding increases, but also the time, what would it look like to allow longer stretches of time in the practicum or at the grad level or at the doctoral level or at the undergrad level, and we can brainstorm that. But also epistemologically, um, how can we acknowledge the value of this research and scholarship in tenure, in promotion, in hiring? Um, I'm on, I'm, I represent AU on the incorporating community engaged teaching and scholarship into promotion and tenure task force, ICETS, has an acronym, it's real. It's the Campus Compact Mid-Atlantic. All the universities in Delaware, in Maryland, in DC are having this conversation right now as we speak about our students want more high impact community-based learning, the communities want it, people are desperate for good data, they want the kind of brain power in this room and the skill sets, and the, and the faculty are interested in it, but why are we not judged in a way that, why are there so many disincentives to this? I mean, I'm on the tenure track, and like all my mentors were like, do not touch it until after tenure. So how can we change the incentive structure um, collectively to kind of m move academia toward this? Um, so. I'll just say, um, and I think we have, 
a slide here, we had an, um, a talk a few times about what are the, what are the, the struggles and, and all the ways this can go wrong, and what are the support mechanisms where we can learn from each other's experiences, figure out what community groups have been you know, good experiences, what are different methods, research methods we can share, how can we train students in this, how can we train stu you know, teachers in this. Um, and so now the question is, what do we advance right now? with a provost that's so excited about this. And I will say he worked um, in Milwaukee mm -hmm. um, and in kind of um, south in, in Indiana, at Notre Dame Marquette, and at Mar yeah. Marquette University. And he said that community-based scholarship was a way for those universities to really break down the town gown divides. It was really like the front door of the university with the communities who are oftentimes struggling, urban and rural, there's so many struggles right now, to be like, we have a lot of resources and it's a win-win, win, frankly, student faculty mm -hmm. and community yeah, yeah. if we can do this in a way that's mutually beneficial, that's open and transparent, and that's really creative and generative and flexible. Um, so, so um, and uh, great. So before we go over the list of, from the previous conversation, I want to talk briefly about what already exists here through Marcy's office. So just uh, many of you know this, so I'm not going to, um, maybe I'm not going to do it at all. Uh, it seems like it's frozen. Um, uh, so we have the CB designation that Marcy mentioned, the community-based learning designation, where your students, if your faculty, would spend 20 hours uh, each throughout the semester working with a community partner. That could be project-based or direct service-based. We also have something called the Community Service Learning Program, uh, which is 40, uh, uh, an individual student can do a one credit add-on to your three credit class and do 40 hours with a nonprofit partner. So as an example, I teach a research methods class in SPA, and I had a student do CSLP where she was an intern, um, or, you know, she did her CSLP placement with Latin, Americans youth, Latin American Youth Center's Research and Evaluation Department. So she was applying what she was learning in class in community. So that's the idea behind the one credit. It needs to be connected to the three credit course. Um, does anyone want to try to help me advance these slides? It's, uh, I, I apparently can't. Um, I could control alt delete, but. Oh wait. Shite. Okay. Looks like this might. Thanks. You supported me, it was moral support. Okay, so, um, so CSS is there to support you um, in finding local nonprofits, um, and they also represent uh, AU um, community engagement work uh, regionally and at other regional and national uh, entities. And there's more, um, uh, there's handouts on your table that talk about this a little bit more. And they have these nonprofit organizational directories to help you find organizations if you're new here or looking for a specific type of organization. And then there's the handout on your desk, your desk, your table um, of the current CB classes so you can see the kinds of different disciplines. I mean, it really is an interdisciplinary thing. You can do it in any, any class. And Marcy has the directories with her if you're, if you're interested. Okay, so. I know you can't really read this. I'm like one of those presenters that I hate where I'm like, I know you can't read it, but I'm going to make you accountable for the information. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so we want to have some three to five really concrete, almost asks, wish list. We don't really know what to call it. It kind of depends on what we come up with. The provost is anxious to hear from us um, on what we could move forward. At his last university, he figured out a way to fund $5,000 community university grants um, for whatever projects, right? We have the Humanities Truck $10,000 grants. There's six of them, I think. Um, but there could be other ways to fund this. Because it does, I mean, we're working with Ward 7 right now. It takes an hour and a half on the metro each way to get there. I have an 8, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. class, which works out because, you know, the, the school starts early. But my 11, 20 students get to spend 45 minutes there and have to turn around and come back. But if we had vans or a car share fund, if you've seen me before, I talk about a car share fund every single time I have an opportunity. Students could get there a lot more, a lot quicker. So as an example, 
something concrete like a car share fund, right? Is the kinds of things that we're looking for. That'll be on the list whether you come up with it or not, I promise. Um, <clears throat> so we did this activity at our Ann Farron workshop where, and this was the section of strategies to advance community-based, uh, community-engaged learning at AU. So work study uh, students, um, using communications more, uh, having fellowships, this idea that we've been talking about for a long time about mapping existing work, knowing who's, who's working with whom, um, summer funding for student internships that involve community. There's lots of different ideas. So these are some ideas up here, but we also want to rely on the expertise at your table and kind of maybe your group could come up with one to three concrete ideas of like, what would you need, whether you, no matter your role, what would you need or what would you imagine one would need um, to be able to do this right and well? Um, um, and what resources, uh, something concrete that the provost office could really support and put mm -hmm. forward. And I'll just say one quick thing. Another thing that we are advancing already is with CTRA's help, we're going to have a database of your scholarship that either draws upon community-based methodology or that's about community-based kind of a meta, you know, scholarship about the epistemology or the pedagogy. So just to see that people in law school are doing legal clinics, people in public health are doing, you know, engaged public health work, people just got this grant, you know, I just got this NSF grant to do kind of an ag extension model working with farmers. So a way to kind of compile our scholarship and our curriculum and our grants and our publications just to show how robust and dynamic the intellectual community is around this. And it could be community-engaged learning however defined. So go ahead and uh, introduce yourselves at your tables. Uh, say your name, where you're from, something that made you smile in the last week, and then move forward. <laughs> so all, we're all being recorded right now, um, and, and we'll begin by saying this is not comprehensive. This is just an attempt to get to Provost Myers, five of his six, four, seven, or eight, um, and then he's going to think about them, and we're going to keep the dialogue going. Um, so yes, maybe we'll just begin now. We'll start with well, this um, we have Brett um, Gilbert of Cogod, and she had a suggestion. Sure. So my suggestion is that each school could have a person who serves as the lead, the community lead. So they would be the person who would be responsible for talking to the faculty to understand who's doing this work, where are they doing it, what are they actually doing. Um, so I think that could be something that we could incorporate. And we also had Louise Leaf, who's working with Philanthropy for Civic Engagement, talk about the importance of showing impact of this research, both, like Alicia was saying, on the communities, but also in scholarship, and that funders would see that impact and be more willing to kind of take the risk on community partner research and think through how there's multiple spillover effects and benefits from that. In this table, if we had two or three. Yeah. So we may have had five. Uh, we'll go through them quick, though. The first one is a some sort of software, a database software for mapping and tracking community gauge work across. I think that would also help centralize communications as well. Uh, the second is having a module, perhaps in AUX or AUX1, which is for undergraduate students so that they are introduced to the concept of community-based research, and maybe even having a Skills Institute class, one of those 95 classes, one credit, so that they can get that, that sort of skills. Um, the third one is for grad students, perhaps a zero credit certificate, similar to SAMI, which is a uh, one for, I think, statistical analysis. Having something like that for graduates, there's an undergraduate certificate. Uh, however, I know, I don't n think that we have one for graduate, correct? The fourth is a, a award ceremony that would recognize people who have done this work currently. And then perhaps seeing if we can work with CSLP to create a, um, seeing if that credit, that one extra credit would be waived for tuition dollars or something like that, getting support that way. Um, and this crew. Um, so uh, we have also five, but some of them actually have been talked about. Uh, our first is a, a little bit of a small pet peeve is that um, uh, grants for the Mellon uh, Award from the Provost Office have, have come back with comments saying oral history is not legitimate research. And that we feel at least, and not to say oral history has to be a critical part of all community-based research and scholarship, but that oral history is essential to building really kind of deep, uh, doing deep engagement and, and has at least been critical in my own work with um, uh, uh, developing those partnerships. So uh, that should be uh, both acknowledged, recognized as, as scholarly um, uh, 
uh, as well. We also thought that we ourselves need to do a better job of, uh, in addition to the provost's office, recognizing that the what we call products that we produce for the community are, and I can understand why we don't necessarily use this word with the community, but that we need to think about it as scholarship, right? So that, so that if we're producing something that might be glossy brochure for the community based on all of this research, that that brochure itself is valued equivalent to kind of a, um, a, a, a paper published in a, a journal, and how can, or at least recognized in terms of the amount of work that's put into that, because currently none of that's acknowledged, and that speaks to your point earlier that you made. Uh, the other thing we said was that um, it takes time and effort to build these partnerships, um, that it would be interesting if we could find ways to do um, you know, they're, not, they're never going to do this, but we might as well say it, course releases or certainly summer pay, the kind of money that we use for um, developing new courses could go into developing new partnerships. Um, we thought, and along these lines, like how do you assess that, but we were thinking that maybe sometimes there needs to be room for failure because like all of us have probably had some experience where we tried to develop a partner and that just didn't work for a variety of reasons and how do we... Um, also acknowledge enough the effort and work that goes into failed partnerships even and they're not always I think our fault sometimes they are um, uh, but sometimes it just wasn't ready for a partnership um, and then um, uh, we also talked we talked about the partnership activity the only thing I would add is it'd be great if everyone could continue to update their own activity so that we could keep that up to date because I feel like if, if it was just done by one central person in this whole school that you're in that could lead to that being um, you know it's hard enough to know what's going on in my own department let alone the whole school uh, uh, and then finally, we just wanted to say a all, all lot of this all has to do with money, and we just think that this needs to be a critical piece of the new capital campaign for raising that money. Yes, agreed. AU's strategic vision has an external partnerships, and we're thinking about how to amplify the community external partnerships with community groups and not just funders. Um, the peer review thing is key. I know an, a, a, other scholars working on this are thinking about community members as part of the peer review process. Hi, I'm Mike. <clears throat> from environmental science um, and so we you know kind of echo a lot of what's already been said here uh, and particularly for me the, the this database and mapping idea as someone who doesn't really know much about this of a means of entry um, in seeing what other people are doing and then uh, getting an idea of who are the potential collaborators out there in the community if, if that's not part of my day-to-day -day. Um, also uh, so being in environmental science and kind of a more technically oriented person thinking about how do we get uh, these disciplines that aren't as well positioned for community engagement to be engaged because I know we can do it somehow like I do a lot of ma like mapping actual you know computer mapping and uh, spatial mapping and that's going to be useful to somebody but how do we turn that into something like this um, uh, leveraging existing expertise around campus so I think this actually goes into what the provost was speaking about uh, yesterday at one of the meet and greet meetings we went to of breaking down the walls among the uh, disciplines in schools and in this case like it was uh, you know maybe there's some expertise in the metro was it metropolitan policy center that and how do we integrate uh, those um, find who those people are and what they're up to and and then also um, is there other opportunities we're always talking about going out into the community, which is great, has tons of benefits. Is there also benefit to bringing the community to AU, uh, benefiting both both community members and obviously the AU community as well? So our table didn't have a faculty member, so we felt a little handicapped. Back. Oh, okay, well, sure, sure. Uh, uh, our conversation focused um, uh, quite a bit around the continuity aspect uh, with engaging partners. So I think uh, finding mechanisms, ways, processes of, of engaging those, those that um, relationship and, and maintaining those and also extending that trust, so. Marketing? 
like I'm talking too much today, but here we go. So uh, a couple of our, our ideas. We think that there needs to be a common language across departments and schools and campuses about what this is, so there's some common definitions, because it's also possible that people are doing things that are very, very similar, but using different terminology. So coming up with that language is important to both define and demystify what the work is about. Um, Second one was related to the sophomore experience. There's been discussions, and I think a committee working on how to enhance the sophomore experience, which, which many students don't find as invigorating, perhaps, as the first year experience. So maybe build it in, because Janelle told us that at some other schools they have some really great ideas and practices at Ohio State. Another one was what is the intersection in terms of the work done in the Career Center and in Center for Community Engagement around internships, community-based learning, community-based research, and both in terms of language to use in students' resumes, but also in terms of paths to different jobs and careers that we could do more to uh, show that all of these are very powerful in terms of opening up your options for the future. Uh, another was, um, Julia mentioned in terms of Finding other faculty, as you mentioned, your work, you ended up working with the translation class. If there could be some kind of way you could search, you know, I'm about to go work at whatever, brain food, and what other faculty or classes have worked there so that that connection can be made and it's not a bunch of isolated incidents with no connection. Uh, we talked about having a, a clearly explicit in the FARS reports that this, this work could be identified and named. We talked about funding. I think kind of like what, what Dan said, that we need incentives for faculty and among the incentives, if there were course development grants, or like you said, a course release or summer pay to revise a class and make it a community-based learning, community-based research class. I do wanna mention Mary Clark has approved $1,000 for four $250 grants that we will be promoting very soon. And that is fantastic, it's just not enough. And then, um, what else? So we had, um, we're running good? out of time, okay. so That's are you? I think we're good. Okay, thanks, Marcy. Thank you, Marcy. There's a lot has been mentioned. I'm just trying to stress a few things that the mini grants, transportation grants, they need to be down there. Um, I run into this. So I teach uh, graduate level, but many of us here at the table have undergraduates in similar situations. Um, the, the things that haven't, the mapping has been mentioned both on the side of who does what, like to find out like what kind of faculty might have connections to areas like I, agriculture, for example. I have students interested in working in agriculture. I have no clue, so I would know that you do that. Um, if our shared bios at AU were a little more searchable, even just that would really be helpful. Um, and that would, you know, that has spillover effects in other ways. Um, that farce or whatever that it's going to be in its place needs to be receptive to having uh, reports uh, done in this way. Whether or not they count, they should, but uh, even if it doesn't count, then we should be able to draw on that information in some way. Um, what I did want to mention is something that AU can build on, the, faculty that the fact that faculty receive teaching credits and students receive uh, uh, you know, teaching credits for these kinds of things, um, uh, and it's not built into, but onto and uh, alongside courses, um, I think is an asset that we have that we can build on, and that had us think um, whether AU should consider mainstreaming community-based research much more into all of what we do as opposed to having it tacked on for those who are interested. But that's really just something to consider. Um, uh, last, uh, logistically, um, I personally and others uh, uh, have mentioned that in different ways, uh, would appreciate better teaching space uh, for community-based learning where often you have students uh, uh, grouped out into teams and much more conducive areas or where there's round tables or at least tables and not like auditorium style seating um, to teach these kinds of courses is really important. We don't have any of that. Or a way to request that, right. Yeah. Or a way to request yeah. it, at the very least. We do have it, but it's, it's spares. I had to fight to get a room in Myers that had round tables because they said my classroom wasn't an event, so I couldn't use that classroom. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I, I okay, we have I one in the back. Fights. One more in the back, I think. Well, most of the things were already taken up, but uh, the one that we wanted to kind of expand on was the actual FARs. 
and maybe uh, setting aside a committee that actually uh, sets sets and does a template to actually present what that actually would look like so that um, everybody understands what what this is and um, how that actually will will grow and, and, and build upon you know what you what you guys actually want to include and what you want to be judged by that way you get out in front of it a little bit ahead of a little bit ahead of time before someone dictates to you what it looks like. Yeah, so having some ownership over that. That's Nobreja Martin. He's our graduate assistant for community-based research scholars. And for those of you who aren't faculty or are new or are students, FARS is the faculty activity report. It's our annual report we have to do to show all the amazing things we do. Um, uh, it's not how it's usually advertised, but that's how I, <laughs> how I convince myself I need to do a FARS, is that it's a way for me to brag about the things that I do. Yes, um, and unfortunately we're out of time, but we have recorded all of your wisdom and insights, um, and we're going to be succinctly summarizing this and sending it to Provost Myers and CCing all of you all. And we want this just to continue the conversation, and so we're also going to be thinking about ways that we can have this conversation without just someone standing up here in Noontime Conversation Style, but more of a workshop where we're really troubleshooting and saying, I tried this, it didn't work, someone help me, oh, you did that too, we can kind of learn from each other. So a way to brag, but also brainstorm. Um, and so I'll pass it on to Anna. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. And a huge thanks to Jane and Garrett for organizing this event. And uh, also, I uh, just want to piggyback on your presentation and say CTRL is also desperate for good data. So please fill out the evaluation so that we know if, uh, whether what we do works. So thank you so much. Thank you. You'll get an email later as well. <laughs>